Welcome to the Doctors' Hospital Distinguished Lecture Series. Every month, we invite members of our medical community to speak on topics that matter to you, the Bahamian public. We trust that you will find this information useful. Now, sit back, listen, and learn. Isn't your health worth it? What the disease influenza is, is a respiratory illness that is caused by a virus. You know, you can get ill or you can get infections from bacteria, from yeast, or from viruses. Well, this one is the type that you can get from a virus, all right? And the virus is called the influenza virus, and we'll get a little bit into that in a minute. So the flu has been called, you may have heard the terms pandemic, or seasonal flu. We heard about seasonal flu, this is the one we know and love. But the pandemic flu is the type of flu or the type of influenza that occurs worldwide. And you just have this widespread, I mean, I'm sure there, if I say something like the swine flu, you've all heard about that. That was a pandemic. In other words, it occurred worldwide and people didn't have any immunity to it. It was something that we couldn't prevent in ourselves because we had no defense, our own natural defense against it. So it was able to spread all over the world. And as you know, pandemics are becoming more and more common because people travel more now. So, you know, if they sneeze in China, we catch a cold because people actually are going to China. Whereas 50 years ago, that was almost unheard of to hear people traveling frequently from the Bahamas to China. That was like, you know, ask my grandmother where China is, you know. So seasonal flu, however, is the one that we know about. That is the one that we say, oh, the flu is going around. You know, right? We really mean it's in our local community and it follows a predictable pattern. So in other words, we know that it occurs between a certain time of year and a certain time of year, and it occurs every year at the same time of year. So that is what we consider to be the seasonal flu. And as I said, it's caused by this influenza virus. So there are three types of influenza viruses that we commonly know about. There may be four, there may be five, there may be six or more, but the three that we commonly um, deal with are the A, B, and C. Quite simple, all right? And I'll start with the C because the C really doesn't mean a whole lot to us. We don't really get um, infected much by the influenza C virus, so we don't really um, pay much attention to it. We don't even test for it. The influenza B is found mostly in humans, and this is the one that you had when you were six years old, when you were a child. You know, most likely that was your influenza B. You got, you got, you get it early in life. You build up an, an immunity to it, and. Um, it doesn't cause pandemics because we are all immune to these influenza Bs, okay? So the Bs are the weaker of the viruses. The bad boy is the influenza A. And this was what the swine flu, for instance, was, was the influenza A. We um, call those by letters such as H1N1. You might have heard that last year's virus was H3N1. We give them all kinds of letters because we're running out sort of like the um, sort of like the license plates now. I don't know where we're going to go next. So we're running out of letters for these viruses. But the influenza A is the one that we get sick from mostly, okay? And it can cause some very serious diseases. For instance, in 1918, so this is 100 years later, this was the year my grandfather was born. 1918, there was the flu pandemic, so it was worldwide. There was no immunity. Of course, there was no flu shot. We can get back into that. And 
So people got sick very rapidly. One third of the world's population had this flu, a one third. And 50 million people died from this virus in 1918. So this was a very serious virus and they called it the Spanish flu. I don't know if you remember hearing about the Spanish flu. So this was a very, very serious, it was one of the worst flu pandemics in history. And that was 100 years ago, all right? So how do we get the flu? All right, the flu is, like I said, it's respiratory. So it starts, it can be from anywhere from your nose to your lungs, can become infected. So when we talk about respiratory, we're talking from nose to lungs, all the way down to your lungs, okay? So it's spread by aerosols. So you sneeze, you cough, you laugh. This is how it's transmitted in the air. And you, as you can see from this picture, one sneeze, and the, those are thousands and thousands, up to millions of little virus particles that can come out in one sneeze, even if you don't see it. Okay, this is a microscopic um, example, but even if you can't see it. The incubation period is 18 to 72 hours. So in other words, you may feel nothing for 18 to 72 hours, but still be infected, all right? That's so, so 72 hours is up to three days ahead that you could actually be infected and have no symptoms, all right? And then we talk about this shedding, all right? So in other words, this virus sheds itself once you spread it out. And you know the virus can land on, on on surfaces that you can go and touch with your hands. And we're gonna be talking about hand washing in a minute. And this slide is a little wordy, but pretty much what I wanted you to see from it is that people with influenza can spread it to others for up to six feet. So up to my Aunt Joy probably, if I sneezed on her, she could get the flu. All right, so, <laughs> so in other words, so you see the people trying to get away from them, all right? And then like I said, um, the people, the, you can also get it by contacting a surface that's been contaminated with the flu. So, you know, you go walk into a restaurant, somebody just coughed or sneezed right there, you put your hand there and boom, there you go, right? So definitely this is why hand washing and um, that type of thing is so important. The flu can make you feel very ill. Has there any, is there anyone in here who has never had the flu? Never had the flu? Bless your soul. The rest of us, you know, call you Hail Mary. <laughs> so however, I will say that you have had the flu. All right, you just did not have the symptoms of the flu, all right? So the, the flu is too much of a pandemic. It's too widespread for anybody to have never contracted it. But there are very few people that get very mild or no symptoms at all from, um, from some of these viruses. But like I said, flu can make you feel really horrible, you and your husband, your boyfriend, whoever can be sick, everybody's sick together. Kids sick, mommy, daddy, everybody's sick at the same time because it is highly contagious, all right? As you can see from those particles. Some of the symptoms include fever, headache, myalgias means those muscle aches, you know, that bone pain, the horrible cough, the stuffy and runny nose is the rhinitis. The eye symptoms, you know, sometimes it feels like either there's sand in your eyes or there's pain behind your eyes. And some people even can get vomiting and diarrhea. Now, we are not talking about the stomach flu now. We're talking about the upper respiratory tract flu, 
but it can sometimes lead to vomiting and diarrhea, especially if some of the infected saliva is dropping into your stomach. Sometimes that can end up causing patients to have vomiting and diarrhea as a result of that. So the symptoms of the flu are usually quite severe for most people when they have it. The severity is even worse whenever we have very young um, patients, infants, or elderly. Now I put over 65 there, right? So I don't want anybody to get bent out of shape. That's just the number they give. I'm calling y'all whoever is over 65 in here elderly, <laughs> okay? So that's the number that they give, all right? Because 65 is the new 45, right? So <laughs> our immunocompromised patients, so patients who are diabetic, who have HIV, who have cancer, those, their immune systems don't work properly, so they're gonna have more of a severe um, um, predisposition to the flu. And also patients who have lung disease, as you could imagine, if you have lung disease, it's part of the respiratory tract. And also if you have heart disease as well, you're gonna be predisposed, you're gonna be the one that I'm gonna be way more careful about, very, very worried about if we have a lot of flu going around in our community. And some of the things that can happen, so why do we care? Because, you know, most of you who've had the flu, you're here, you look fine to me. Um, most of the time, in the majority, overwhelming majority of cases, people have the flu and then they get better, correct? But, however, there are, like I said, especially in that subset of patients who we're worried about who could get it very severely. Some of the complications include croup, especially in our young kids. Remember croup with the babies, all right, that croupy cough. That could happen as a result of that same influenza virus. And also you can have a pneumonia, that's just a viral pneumonia. That's a nightmare for a doctor. It's hardly any medication could treat that, okay? There's no antibiotics, because remember, antibiotics are for bacteria. This is a virus, all right? What could also happen is sometimes you can get a secondary bacterial infection, so your immune system is so shut down that now the bacteria can come in. You had the virus, and now here comes the bacteria to join the, the crew, and that can cause, so these are some of the names of the bacteria that could follow a bad flu. Streptococcus, I mean, they just sound horrible, right? Staphylococcus, hemophilus, all of that stuff. I know how to say it, <laughs> that's what my patients say. So, so those are pretty bad bugs, and they can come as a result of having a bad flu as a complication. So some of the non-lung-like complications would include myositis. This is where the muscles um, break down. You could actually have a muscle breakdown. The flu can affect the heart. We've seen this several times where the flu actually caused the heart to become compromised. We've had encephalopathy where the flu goes to the brain and you've had the virus go to the brain and cause damage to the brain as well too. Um, and here I just made note of some patients, young patients in the United States that actually got flu encephalopathy. Liver and um, central nervous system, that's something called Ray syndrome as well as peripheral nervous system. So the rest of your body, the nerves in your body could become affected and it's called Guillain-Barre syndrome. So none of those things sound like something anybody really would want, correct? But those are some of the known complications of the flu that can occur, rarely, but have occurred. So the mortality from the flu or what causes people to die is usually the complications, all right? So it's usually because of the pneumonia or like I said, the heart. 
All right, those are gonna be some of the reasons why, or the main reasons why people die as a result of the flu. And 90% of the deaths were those over 65 years old, all right? So in the older population, those are gonna be the ones dying. Although more recently, and I'll talk about that, um, we've had, especially in Florida, a number of children dying from flu as well too. It's been actually more this year than it has been since the early 2000s. So that's a little bit scary as well too. So how do we know that you've had the flu? You have the symptoms that we talk about and you go and you see your doctor because you feel ill, you don't feel well. What is it that can be done to say that this is the flu or this is the influenza virus that's causing this? So one of the things that they could do is our cultures, just like anything else, if you have an infection in your body, what we do is we take a culture. So we try to grow what's in your body. And we could do that with a nose or a throat swab or with tissue culture, all right, or eggs. This is very rarely done. All right, very, very rarely because it has to go to the lab and it takes a week, two or more before you get your results. Well, most of you are cured by that, I would hope, right? So this is not what you're gonna want to have done if you, if you want to know if you have the flu because that's something you're gonna wanna know right away, right? Serology is taking blood tests, same thing. Those tests could take days before we get a uh, uh, a result from them because indeed once again you're sick now and you kind of want to know what's going on right now so the most commonly done are the rapid tests okay and these are either nose or throat swabs that we do with a rapid reagent in the lab that could tell us within an hour or two whether or not you have a flu. That sounds a little bit more reasonable, correct? And what they test for is this influenza A or influenza B, all right? And say whether or not you 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 have ha whether or not you have really have the flu. The other thing that we do is just a provisional we just look at you and say you have the flu, you know, but of course you didn't have to pay me for that. You could go to your grandmother and she could tell you that, right? Mm -hmm. So, however, if there's an outbreak though, however, we could, you can say, well, this is the swine flu or this is the Spanish flu or whatever. So provisional diagnosis is also important just because it can also give us information. If we start seeing, that's how we knew swine flu was coming, this thing was coming, that thing was coming, because people started coming to the doctor, and although there was provisional done, after a while you have to start testing and say, oh, this is an epidemic, or this is a pandemic happening. So what do we do to treat? Now you have the flu, you have, you, let's say you go to the doctor, you get a rapid test. It says, yes, you have influenza. What do we do with that? So nowadays, this is what can be done. All right, have any of you been treated with Tamiflu? But most of you have had the flu, right? But nobody's been treated with this, right? And it's available right here now, so, right? Well, that's because most of us do this. Rest, increase your fluids, take your Tylenol, and stay home, right? Okay, so, and it works, correct? It works, yeah, for the most part, right? If, however, you go and your symptoms are severe, let's say, especially, I used to work in the emergency room for 15 years, and we have patients come in that are very, very ill or almost to the point of pneumonia or even to the point of pneumonia, we want to know whether or not this really is the flu. And we do the rapid test and it shows that they have the flu. If they have had symptoms for less than that 72 hour, 48 to 72 hour period, they can be treated with Tamiflu. It doesn't work if you've been sick for a week, all right? So that's one of the reasons why it's not very um, it's not given out very often. I'll tell you, when we did have the last big outbreak, we were giving it out like water because it, everybody was, was getting diagnosed with this H1N1, 
all right? And this was one of the treatments for it. It comes in a liquid form for kids as well as a tablet. There's also injectable antivirals as well. Nobody really wants those, right? But they're, they're there. Um, as well as nasal sprays that are antivirals also. All right? But once again, for the overwhelming majority of us, this is what we're gonna do, correct? And please don't forget this stay home part, okay? Don't spread your flu, all right? Stay home. So now, have you ever had a cold, ma'am? Who, you, who didn't have the flu? Not even the cold, hey, not even the cold. A cough, maybe, there you go. Everybody else has had the flu and the cold, correct? <laughs> yes, because even more common than the flu is the cold, all right? So the common cold is also caused by a virus, all right? And it's the most common, the most common, most common infectious disease in America. And I can tell you, in the Bahamas as well, too. The common cold, all right? Nobody, and I mean nobody, will die from the cold, all right? Zero. There are no complications from the cold, all right? The viruses that are associated with these we build up immunity to them very, very easily. And so the common cold, you have very mild symptoms and they rarely go on to anything else unless it's gonna progress on to the bad boy, the influenza, all right? The, the influenza vi um, virus, like we said, is the one that is highly contagious, spread through the air, and it's usually peak season or a pandemic, as we talked about, all right? So a lot more serious than our common cold, all right? So when should we go back to work? You have the cold, no, I'm sorry, you have the flu, and you stayed home, you did your due diligence, you have to wait until you're, well, first of all, when your doctor tells you to, right? Correct, because other things could be going on. But also, too, the CDC Centers for Disease Control recommends that you stay home for at least 24 hours after your fever is gone, okay? And like I said, unless the doctor says otherwise. And if you start feeling bad while you're at work, you should go home, don't just try to, yeah. And notice this one, the fever should be gone without the use of fever reducing medicine. So if you're still taking the Tylenol, of course the fever is gonna be gone, correct? But you have to stop, see what happens. And if you've gone past your 24 hour period and you're feeling well and doctor says it's okay, then you can go back to work because then you're not contagious. But, you know, I'm sure you've heard and, you know, any of you who've worked knows, know that, you know, you could have the whole office sick, all right? Or, you know, poor teachers when half the class because y'all send those children to school <laughs> sick, not good, okay? Teachers sick, principals sick, everybody's sick. So let's stay home when we have the flu, okay? Proper hand washing. All right, now this one is, this is near and dear to me because um, we have an initiative here at Doctors Hospital called Hand Hygiene that, um, that uh, I institute and we put in place with my infection control team. And we take it very, very seriously because it's important that I'm trying to take care of you as a physician or a nurse, but I, can't, I shouldn't be giving you something, correct? So hand washing is very, very important and doing it properly is very important, all right? So if you don't have a zinc, then use your alcohol-based hand sanitizers, okay? So, you know, you can buy the little hand sanitizers and take them around with you because you never know when you're going to get in a situation where you have to maybe touch something and you need to, to sanitize your hands afterwards and there's no warm water or soap around, okay? So you want to scrub the back of your hands as well as in between your fingers and if you have long nails under your nails as well too and you want to do it for 20 seconds and one of the things one of the little tricks that we say is sing happy birthday song from the beginning to the end you sing it twice and that should give you the amount of time that you should be washing your hands rinse your hand 
when you're done, rinse it. And then you can either use a clean towel or you can air dry your hand. Or if you have a dryer in the restroom that you're, you're at, you can dry your hands that way as well too, all right? But it's very important, especially if you access public services a lot, um, to make sure that you're washing your hands properly. Um, when you're you know, in hospital, for instance, in doctor's hospital, as well as in Princess Margaret Hospital, there are hand sanitizers all over the place. You should use them. And like I said, even better, carry around your own hand sanitizer. Be responsible for your own health as well, too. So how do we prevent the flu? So we talked about the proper hand hygiene. That's one way to prevent it. Just don't contact people who are sick. That's a little bit hard to do sometimes, especially if you work or if you're always around people. That's a little bit difficult to do. Um, the other thing that I always like to say is cover your sneeze or cover your cough as well too. Um, sneezing and coughing into, into a towel or a tissue or into your elbow. Um, and that's because, you know, if you do it into your hands, once again, you may not be able to access something to, to sanitize your hands right away. So you want to do that as well, too. And, of course, getting the flu shot. And this is the one that I'm sure all of you want to hear about, correct? So let's talk about the flu shot, all right? So the flu shot is, is, the, is the vaccination that we use to prevent the seasonal flu, all right? So this is the flu virus that, that is, or the flu viruses that are circulating in our communities annually, all right? A new dose is needed each season. So your last year's flu shot will not cover you this year because what the microbiologists and virologists have determined is every year there's usually a new form or new forms of the virus that are circulating. So for you to be protected, you need to get a new flu shot annually, all right? There's no live viruses in the flu shot, but we're going to come back to that. But there are many viruses, and they are constantly changing. So in other words, the viruses are mutating all the time, and hence this is why we have to get a flu shot every year. It takes about two weeks to build up an immunity. So once you get your flu shot, it's about two weeks before you're really, really immune. So you still need to protect yourself in that short period of time. The reactions that you can get are very mild or very serious. The very mild reactions can occur between six to 12 hours after the injection. They could be things like pain or swelling at the injection site. You can get flu-like illnesses, and I know I can get a debate on this, flu-like <laughs> illnesses, all right? And the very, very, very rare complications, um, serious complications like that Guillain-Barre where the nerves get affected or the brain gets affected also too, all right? But um, those very mild reactions, like I said, usually generally can, can occur between 6 to 12 hours after you've received the flu shot. All right, y'all read that for me, please. Read it out loud. Say it again. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> and that is where I will end my presentation. We hope you've learned a lot from this edition of the Doctors Hospital Distinguished Lecture Series. Please join us in the Luden Conference Center on Dowsville Street every third Thursday for the monthly health talks where you can feel free to ask your questions. Isn't your health worth it? Thank you.